everyone. Um, thank you for joining us uh, for Creative Cooking with the Earth's Next Great Resource Mycoprotein. Um, we are very excited to have Chef David Burke with us um, and to introduce him. Uh, I would like to introduce, I would like to say, uh, as Stephen Khalil, Executive Chef North America for Corn Foods, to come up uh, to introduce the chef. Thank you, Jennifer, and welcome everyone. Corn is very proud to be a sponsor of this event um, and very excited to have Chef Burke um, demonstrate how, working with um, our wonderful product. If you're not familiar um, with our alternative meatless protein, it is, if you remember Spike talking about mycelia or mycelium this morning, mycelium being the um, singular, mycelia being the plural, um, it's fungi. It's the fungi that um, mushrooms uh, grow from. Mushrooms are the fruit of this um, what this strain of fungi that we use called Fusilium, uh, fer um, fer Fusilium veridinatum, <laughs> and um, it's high in protein, low in sat fat, low, no sat fat, low fat, um, and very high naturally in um, fiber. So we've invited our good friend Chef Burke to come. Um, some of you may know him. Uh, fueled by his passion and grit for a knack of artful innovation, David Burke is one of the best known and most respected chefs in modern American cuisine. Acknowledged as a leading pioneer in American cooking, Burke, a New Jersey native, is also recognized internationally for his revolutionary techniques, exceptional skills, successful restaurant empire, and many TV appearances. In the parlance of today's celebrity-driven culture, he's a rock star of the culinary world. At just 26, Burke's kitchen mastery won him the executive chef position of New York City's legendary River Cafe. While there, he became the first American, now bear with me here, ever to win, say it. Meilleur ouvrier de France. Uh, honorary <laughs> diploma. <laughs> so, uh, along with many other honors, including Time Out's culinary prankster, please welcome our dear friend, Chef David Berg. All right. I like that. Thank you. A nice, a nice accent on that. Now we know, how, we know how to say it, so thank you. Nice to be here. And uh, Stephen and I have worked in the past uh, over the years. And uh, when I, he called me to try this product out, of course, I was uh, interested. Uh, I, wouldn't, I wasn't excited, but I was interested. And I came to my door uh, during the pandemic, and uh, my puppet and I cooked with it. I do have a puppet. He's a, <laughs> he was my sous chef during the pandemic. We made videos together. But as I started working with it, I, re I started eating it at home and realized how good it was, not, not judging it as a plant-based product, just eating it. And it has this, uh, uh, no aftertaste, it's great texture, and it's very convenient, especially for someone that's not used to eating at home, for me to just heat and serve. You know, in a restaurant, chefs, you know, we, just, we don't have to sit and eat, we just grab things and we eat. And uh, we sometimes maybe eat 20 meals, 21 bite meals a day instead of sitting down and eating. So we started to play with it. The seasoning on it was really good. The texture again, the clean finish. And the versatility is really what was important to me. Plant-based is important as well. Uh, and I think it's important to some of my clientele that we stay ahead and start experimenting and offering things that are not necessarily starting from, if you look at, I graduated CIA 40 years ago. 40 years ago, I graduated the CIA. <laughs> and back then, if it, didn't have a, if it didn't have a sauce on it, I wasn't touching it. Everything was about being a saucier back then, because all, the, you know, the, all of the teachings were French food, and sauces were, you know, any young chef wanted to be a saucier. If you, you know, so, so you know, we've changed, obviously, that you don't even see sauciers in restaurants anymore. You, and most people are just equally created as a cook, and you, somebody does make stocks and sauces. Some places don't even make stock anymore because there's such good product being produced that you can actually 
buy it without buying the bones. Anyway, that being said, we do, speaking of stock, we do have a stock. Our first stock is a vegetable stock, or it could be made with chicken and tomato juice. We call this a tomato stock. And uh, this recipe is from my first cookbook, and we just adapted it, and now it, it was a vegetarian, it's a vegetable uh, base that had poached chicken in it. We poached the chicken right in it. We're gonna poach the product right in it. And these are cutlets. And I gotta tell you, they look like chicken cutlets. They eat like a chicken cutlet, and they're plant-based. And they're easy to produce, and the texture's good. And, and there's no aftertaste. Sometimes when you get the pea proteins and some of the other, you get a little bit of an aftertaste that, kind, you know, that makes you question it because it's just not a normal taste for you. So I have, uh, I have uh, the stock coming to a boil. It's a simple, it's a simple, it's a simple as I burn myself. So tomato juice or tomato puree and um, broth, right? And then we're going to add some. Of, I'm going to add the vegetables first, and then I'm going to add the chicken breast. So it's very simple. It's ratatouille. It's onions. It's eggplant. And it's peppers. And it's zucchini. And it's more peppers. And then I think we're good. And we're just going to simmer this. I'm going to add couple of the breasts. This was one of my favorite ones because when I first got them, they were all the breaded ones, the little chicken wings, which we put on our, one of our uh, newest restaurant's menu as an appetizer. This would be a main dish. So I'll put two or three of them in, leave a couple of them out. And uh, this is a one pot dish. I'm gonna just I have orzo that's been blanched already. The orzo is going to add some bulk to this dish. It's really a pasta. It's a broth. It's a pasta. It's a chicken dish. It's a vegan dish now. It's a, or it's a plant-based dish. Salt, pepper. And orzo is another one of those things that's not really used that often, but when people do serve it, they tend to like it. So. This is gonna, this will be cooked in two, three minutes. I got Parmesan cheese, mascarpone cheese. So this is mascarpone. We know what mascarpone cheese is. That's what they make tiramisu with. It's a sweet cream cheese. And this is pretty firm. It's been a little bit whipped. But like I was saying earlier, in the old days, in the French cuisine days, we made lots of mousses, not just chocolate mousse. We made shrimp mousse, lobster mousse, tomato mousse. And this is a black olive mousse. So it's a black olive puree that I'm gonna put into a little bit of mascarpone. I could use a tapenade of sun-dried tomatoes or basil oil for this. We do have some basil somewhere, do we? We don't have basil? Okay, I'm leaving. <laughs> oh, there you go. Uh, yeah. Some leaves. Uh, so it's easy to take either whipped cream, yogurt, mascarpone, flavor it with something that's gonna complement the dish you're making. And we're gonna show you how to charge an extra 10 bucks for, for this little garnish. Well, we're in Napa, so it's 15. So you got a black olive mousse now. Okay, we're gonna heat that spoon up. That can go in there and leave me a little more basil. So now we're, Broth is coming along. You can see how this cuts. Look, can you see the texture here? This is a room temp. That looks like a perfectly sous vide chicken breast. And I'm not a sous vide fan, just to be. I am too, sometimes. But I think people need to learn how to cook first before they start spending 15 cents on a Ziploc bag for every time they, they want to sous vide something. Chef? Maybe it's 25 cents. All right, so the broth is coming along. Um, now, if you have any questions, as we go, just ask. Because Steve, if I can't answer them, Stephen can. And uh, I, I was just going to say that. I was going to ask if you want questions as yeah, we go along. Yeah, you can, you can, it'll, uh, it'll help us move along. 
Delicious, by the way. I hate to say so myself, but it's pretty good. Are any of you familiar with corn and fungi-based alternative proteins? And just, did you get, uh, become familiar with it here in the U.S. or in the U.K.? In the U.S. Um, corn is the number one meatless brand in the U.K., and they've been producing it ever since, uh, for the past 30 years or more. Um, and it's, it's very funny because the founder was an industrialist so who actually made here. movies as well, but had a milling uh, medium, and he wanted to find um, a source for his um, okay, surplus of wheat. And, uh, right here. and he also wanted to find a sustainable protein uh, on, for the planet. And they found this fun guy. You got it. Kind of like David, he's a fun guy. Now, are you, is corn currently being is sold in, uh, in uh, certain stores, certain yes. chain Kroger, restaurants? Kroger's our number one customer, and we're also in um, Whole Foods. Um, we're in distribution through DOP for food service. Um, and uh, we're looking into get, getting through other, some other distribution channels as well for food service. I, I, my orzo, can I get the orzo? Okay, we're going to add the orzo to this broth. Chicken's warm through, the, the corn. Now, we say chicken, we say chicken uh, as it is chicken because it's that identical. But we also, we're using it as a chicken replacement in this dish, but we're also going to use it as a starch or as a crouton, we're not just gonna look at it. And sometimes we tend to keep, I kept thinking it of as chicken. I was thinking chicken recipe, chicken recipe. Then I realized, you know, you can use it as a vegetable, because it is. And uh, we will start using the patties in our restaurants, maybe, maybe mixed with meats, but not necessarily, you know, as, but as a substitute for grilled eggplant or as a substitute for potato pancake, we might use something like this. That, that might work well, and you'll see that in the next dish. So orzo goes in, bit of orzo, and uh, if I can get a larger spoon, I might not burn my knuckles. There we go. Okay, so you've got a really healthy and aromatic dish here. And more basil, you get some more basil floating? Thank you. So we got the orzo, the veg ragu, we're gonna put some in the bowl. Sometimes this, this dish is actually better the next day. I know because uh, it's, it thickens up. And here comes the beauty. And there's another piece here. I'll let that simmer a little bit more. The, um, but this is something we could serve in our restaurant easily, and people would be happy with it. So the people that were looking for plant-based dishes, if, we, they were, if this was served on a I, I would certainly eat this. And so I'm heating up the spoon just because I'm adding that extra $5 to the dish. And this is the black olive. Moose, trying to make a quenell here. Uh, so you want to add a little bit of richness or fat to the dish. In fact, the dish is fat-free at this point. A little black olive mousse, a little parmesan, and some basil. So this is dish number one of using the plant-based protein. Yeah, Simple and, and from, I mean, the, the, the broth is, can be a veg broth or just tomato juice and some water. And you're making a vegetable broth as you're cooking it. You're adding some, some bulk with the, um, with the orzo. It's clean, it's beautiful, and you can use this. And this is restaurant quality dish. And I think using the protein in that way where it's poached in the broth is absorbing like a sponge. And we'll talk about sponges in a few minutes. But like, like a sponge, you're, uh, you're flavoring the product. And uh, speaking of sponges, go ahead. I believe the CIA is going to be um, showcasing that product at the reception tonight. Oh, um, oh this dish? Good, yeah. 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 
speaking of sponges and bread crumbs and bread of products, this one's my favorite. It's got the spices in the bread. And I, you know, this is the thing I'd be eating at home and I'd forget what I was eating. I thought I was eating chicken. I just, because it was easy access. I kept it in the freezer. I could microwave it, then brown it, or just saute it. And uh, what, what I'm going to do is saute. So when we talk about breadcrumbs, and I learned this, I don't know, I was once a teenager, and my job was to bread things. I breaded things for hours. I breaded things so my fingers were breaded. And, uh, and we, then we'd have to saute them. We saute them in bacon fat and all kinds of different things. And that was the old days. And then you thought about breading, and someone told me, and I forget who it was, that because they say, save all the bread and dry it. Keep it up on the, above the broiler and dry it out. And we do that with stuffing and stuff too now. And then we'd grind it, make bread crumbs, and it was super dry. So the reason it was super dry in the old days was because it would absorb all the fat, right? And anything breaded way back when was a schnitzel, really pounded thin, less meat than breading, right? And then that, all that fat, usually was chicken fat or beef fat, would be absorbed into the, pro, into the bread. So that's where you got some of your protein from the fat. I'm just going to saute this. So then someone said, well, if it's dry bread, like a dry sponge, it's going to absorb more water. Sponge absorbs more water when it's dry, right? So if the bread is wet, it'll drub, absorb less oil. So if you're going to bread something of high quality, and you're not starving to death, and you don't need all that fat, use wet bread. Or, or wet the bread because then it'll absorb less oil. Still get crispy, but it'll absorb less oil and still get the crunch. So I just thought that was interesting because everyone's always like, my grandmother said, use Italian bread and dry it out. My grandmother said, put the olive oil in the water. You know, these things have their, their terms before you realize, you know what, that really doesn't make sense in the century we're living. And, and as you progress and you start eating products like this, you start to realize change is always good. So now I'm, I'm sauteing uh, two cutlets in good olive oil, two cutlets, two patties, spicy. They have the seasoning on this is on point, so you don't have to season this. I'm going to put some beets in here. This is breading, and I'm going to poach some eggs. Now, I got two poached eggs here, and I'm like, we're in wine country, so we're going to poach them in red wine. We're making some sort of... Got to turn that up. Does that go higher? So we're going to poach our eggs in red wine. Now, there's a classic French dish called Herbe Murette, where they poach you in red wine. And there's enough acid in the wine where you don't have to add vinegar, so you, your egg is going to taste like red wine as opposed to vinegar. So I could have I had a little bit of a deeper, uh, a deeper pot, but I think you guys get the idea. So, so we're making Eggs Benedict, but the protein is on the bottom where the English muffin would be. So now I'm replacing the English muffin or with the, the patties, which I did not season because I didn't want to put a little salt, because the spice on these is pretty good. And then I'm going to connect, reproduce, this is actually my Canadian beet bacon. Put a little more spice on that. And actually, it's really fun to start getting creative with, with some of this stuff because you wind up adapting it and eating it. Because as I get older, I eat more vegetables. I don't do it consciously. I, I don't know. I just, my body kind of craves it. I, like, I don't eat the way I used to eat. And we got red wine eggs, and we got red wine sauce, and we got... And but now when you eat a dish, when you start using it with uh, 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 plant-based proteins and things like that, so we all want flavor, no matter what. Texture is important, too. Texture, flavor, integrity, all important to what you're eating. And it, it not necessarily has to replace something. Like, you know, I was saying earlier how, oh, you know, I kept thinking of it as chicken. If you look at the Impossible Burger, the Impossible Burger is supposed to replace meat. And, and then we start really looking at the Impossible Burger and realize there's so much processing going on and it smells like beef when it's charred. And I don't get reminded that it's a vegetable. 
and somewhat, I want to be somewhat reminded. You know, I want to be reminded I'm eating something that's good for, for every, for the planet, good for sustainability, good for myself. And I can get that with this because I get this cleanness that's not even in chicken, but also, and the umami that's present makes me want more. I go back and I go back. All right, so we got red wine eggs. We got this. I need herbs. I need, do we have any long herbs or are they all cut? Uh, That's all right. They get, they're going to use their imagination. Imagine these are long herbs. Hey, Chef David, did, did you yes. know that fungi, the genetic makeup of fungi is more, has more in common with animals than it does with plants? You got to you speak up. I'm sorry. The genetic makeup of fungi has more in common with animals than plants. Oh, that's interesting. That's interesting. Well, also mushrooms in general, that we used to always put mushrooms in our stock. And I used to, when I worked with Wally Maloof, who used to be the dean of this Culinary Institute of America, I worked with him side by side. And he was like, you save every piece of every mushroom. And we used to, we used to use dry mushrooms back then. We didn't have fresh morels and chanterelles in the US yet. And we'd put them in our stocks. And you know, in the school, they didn't teach us mushroom in stock. It was more mirepoix. And he goes, Mung mushrooms have the umami. And when you put those into the stock, you know, he put 12 pounds of mushrooms into a stockpile. He goes, you, you know, your brain is tasting it and telling you it's delicious. You might not taste mushrooms in a 50-gallon batch of chicken stock that you make putting 15 pounds of mushrooms in, but there's, your, your, your senses are telling you there's something delicious in here. Okay, so here's uh, delicious and sexy. Look at this. Red wine, eggs. Now, I'm going to give you a white one, too, because i got a white one here. Because I don't like to do it. And this one's cold, but I'm not trying to fool you. But you got a red and a white, because the red one doesn't look as good with the beet. But I'm just showing you some technique. And uh, the hollandaise is here. And hollandaise has lasted. Throw some chives. And don't forget some salt. Where's a little salt? Pepper. Now, when you go through Can I get some of that red wine back? When you go through some of the uh, the cutting of this, now the textures of this is going to be great because you have the beet this is not un, not far off from what the ham would be. You got the crispy product there. I'm just gonna and that's eggs benedict with plant based corn protein. And again, Carmine's with me and Paul and my those I mean this is I think that'd be a more interesting eggs benedict to, for me to eat. And like I said, I don't need, now I don't need a side of potatoes to fill the plate, right? Because I'm going to get that, that English muffin, which I love. We serve all our burgers with English muffins because they taste better than the roll. But now you've got more texture, you get more hardiness, and you get more value. You were asking earlier where the product's available. Um, yes. And I told you Kroger, but as far as food service, I forgot to mention that those patties, the spicy patties, uh, which are vegan, um, Boneless, meatless bonus wings and meatless pieces are also available through U.S. Foods under the brand name Molly's Kitchen. Molly's Kitchen, okay. Well, we, we opened a restaurant called The Goat in Jersey, on the Bay Shore in Jersey, and we put the, one of the products on as a chicken parm, bites, as a snack, 15 bucks for five pot bites. And in a air, blue-collar area, not where some of our other restaurants, not the Upper East Side, and it sold pretty good, <laughs> you know, because, it, and, and honestly, when the wait staff ate it, they, 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 you know, they had no idea, because I said, just send it out, because then we'll tell them. But we wanted to put it on the menu intentionally to let people know that we're ahead of the curve and we're thinking. You know, we're thinking about what's coming, even though, you know, if you go to LA, San Francisco, to major cities and Whole Foods and the markets like that, you know, they, you expect to see this. But eventually it trickles down and becomes, and, you know, it's like, why not? Let's try this, all right? And when you, when you have a commitment that's a shareable five-byte thing for a table at 15 bucks, that's how you creep in. 
and people say, no, it's pretty good. Or, or that's the place that has that plant-based dish, you know? Um, okay, where are we at now? Soup. Soup. Moving along. So I got two soups. They're made already. One's carrot, one's peas, peas and carrots. And then I need to heat my uh, crout. They're not croutons, they're plant-based cubes. But when I see a cube, what do you think? of? I think of croutons. Look like croutons. Look like tofu a little bit. All right, I'm like, yeah, it looks like a crouton. It's going to act like a crouton. Tastes better than a crouton. All right. And guess what? I can charge more than a crouton because it's, <laughs> it's novelty. So I have the two soups here, but I'm going to saute them in some olive oil. I'm just keeping this here to keep the soups warm. They're both here. You can see that? A carrot soup, you do have a recipe, and a pea soup. And again, pretty, delicious, and, um, and funny. And that's a good way to introduce the plant-based protein as a crouton and give people an idea of, you know what, I can use this. It's not, it's not just a crispy chicken sandwich. You know? Again. Now I could dust this in, I don't need to dust it in anything, but I could. I'm going to just throw it in here. Start to brown. Okay, soup. You want green on the outside or orange? I haven't done this in a while, so I need. I might need your help. Uh, okay, I'll figure this out. Orange on the outside. It's a little thick. It's okay. Well, I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I'm gonna give you a Yelp review tomorrow. <laughs> You're doing great. So we got art, we got the soup here, one, one version of the soup, and then we got the green. And we got our plant, and you see how this is firm enough, it's holding up, and that's absorbing really high quality olive oil, right? So we got another layer of flavor. It's the sponge effect. Yeah, I didn't, it's not breaded, but it is, it is taking in some of that oil. It's not taking it in like a, like a dry bread, like, but man, that's good. A little red pepper on there, a little salt. And we lift my bed. And there's another version of the corn plant-based protein as a crouton in a soup that just took us from a $12 soup to a $22 soup. <laughs> I haven't made a soup like that in a long time either, it's like the old, the old days. <laughs> like two soups in one bowl. Anyway, that looks good too. You, you didn't taste that one? I left you a little Scooby snack. Oh, I didn't know it was for me. You're supposed Sorry. to say, oh my God, this is so delicious. So delicious. <laughs> yum, 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 okay. Yum, 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 yum. Next. Okay. Corn on the cob because I couldn't help myself. <laughs> All right. This is one of my favorites too. These are the wings. These are the ones we put on the menu. Now, we can saute them like I just did. These are lightly breaded too. We baked them to, again, now they're baked, so they're actually 
healthier. Although olive oil is a good thing to saute in. So uh, I need a saute pan. Corn on the cob. That's a cob. <coughs> I don't have a recipe, so I'm going to. I don't really follow recipes anyway. I think you put corn in the pan. I'm making succotash with peas instead of. We shaved the corn off the cob with a knife. We did that. <laughs> you did that. Okay, you think I can't read now? Okay, okay. 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 with the succotash. Peppers, corn, all out here. Okay, good. So we're going to put a few peppers here. Peppers, corn. A little bit of corn. Peas. And a little bit of peas. All right, and the peas. I need more. Yeah, so. Salt and pepper. Okay, we got salt and pepper. And the cow. Okay. And we got these, which we don't trap. We, we don't leave home without the blocks. So I'm going to show you two presentations here. So I might need two. I think we're serving these tonight too. I'll put this one in there. Okay, we got a. So we're just sauteing, making succotash right now. The nuggets, which is what we, we served five of these with a little tomato and cheese on it, basil oil, fantastic. And these are good snacks. And we're gonna do a couple of things. That all, everything? Okay. okay. So, we use this place, it's the place you chose? I'm taking it, you gave it to me. Oh yeah, yeah. You can charge them more, bigger. <laughs> no, it looked better with the yellow. So, all right, so here we go. So we take uh, a corn on the cob, like this. We take another one over here. And we need some of these. I do need that other plate, that long rectangle one. The other plate I need. Sorry. Oh. Here we go. Okay. So we got a little base, you know, a little, a little corn here, right? So I'm gonna make a little something here, just to keep it simple. Build a little base of these. Barbecue. So this is the, basically it's a corn salad, crispy corn salad. It's chicken wings with succotash, barbecue. And again, this is some, just another way to use this. This is a knife and fork version. This is a finger food version. to get some on the plate, Dave. And we have, we use certain, uh, you know, we serve certain appetizers on blocks like this. We do it to actually something called wings and rings, which is chicken wings and calamari and octopus and chorizo, 
And we, this is moving toward the shareable appetizer product that, uh, that also catches people's eye when it, when it leaves the dining room. So here's another version of the barbecue chicken wing with corn. Just to play on the words, and it's delicious, and it's, like I said, shareable, snackable, another, another way of looking at a plant-based product as a replacement to junk food, like chicken wings with buffalo and all this stuff. <laughs> and we've got seven more dishes. No. <laughs> Any other any questions as we go? Now this is snackable, love it, and it's also got the you know we we put the veg in with it. So to me, if I I could go to a local, even a family restaurant like a chain and get something like this, I'd be more inclined to order it than a spinach artichoke dip, a quesadilla, or a traditional buffalo chicken wing, or even at an airport. Airport, if I could get this as I travel, I'd be very happy. Next dish. All right, we're gonna make some. Um... Okay, okay. Well, there is corn crumbles. There's corn uh, almost like for bolognese, ground. Uh, I don't know if it's exactly called ground, but it's crumbled. And I've had, I have a ton of it in my freezer at home, but I don't make, I don't batch that out as much. But I'll put that in scrambled eggs, and sometimes I'll make. I've made a chili with it, also. And today we're making lettuce cups with it, and I'm sorry, but I gotta rest my foot a little. All right, so olive oil. Again, and here's the product. Even as it's crumbled, you see it? Looks good, acts good, tastes good, and it's clean, and it's moist. I don't know if there's a, uh, a reason it'll stay moist, but I've never had it dried, and I'm sure I've overcooked it at home. Well, okay, olive oil, garlic, ginger, shallots. Meat, not meat, but it's fooling me and uh, I'm gonna need, and then you got lettuce cups. I think these are lettuce cups. These look like big lettuce cups. We're gonna trim some of them up. Okay, well, we're gonna figure it out. We're gonna play for this? I've never had luck serving lettuce cups. We use, uh, we use uh, baby gem sometimes, but. This you can fold. We'll do it right on the plate. There's one. There's two. There's three. There's four. Huh? Okay. So I have some flavor profile building. It's garlic, shallots, ginger, and um, salt and pepper. And there's a little soy sauce here. Or slurry that we made a little Asian uh, Asian glaze. These are called sweetie drop peppers. They're sweet and sour. Throw some of those in there. I don't need this or that, and I do need two. Spoons, any spoons? Small spoon and a knife. Knife. Okay. So, Chef Burke, I have a, a question for you, if that's okay. Go ahead. Um, so, I wanted to ask you. So, earlier we had uh, Chef Spike Mendelson from Plant Burger here, okay. and we've had a couple of other chefs talking about how when they are introducing plant-based uh, ingredients 
to their menus that, that what well, Chef was, uh, Spike Mendelson was saying that I think 85% of his clientele is actually, doesn't identify as vegetarian or vegan. Um, that they're more of a flexitarian, you know, like you're saying, uh, interested in, uh, you know, products that are healthier for the earth, that are healthier for themselves. And so I'm wondering when it, it's coming to your restaurants and these kinds of introductions to your menus, how, um, how are you marketing them? How are you talking about them? Um, and do you find also uh, a similar thing that your uh, customers are not necessarily, it's not vegans fully going for this, or is it, do you find across the board? I, I think that, uh, I don't think it's necessarily vegans. I think it's people that are more, that trust the brand, that trust what we're doing, that want to try something new, want to be a little more experimental. I think that it has to be, like we were talking last night, there's so much real estate on a menu. I only have so much real estate on a menu. So if I want to put a plant, based product on it's got to be really good because otherwise it just sits there and it takes in it takes up a parking spot right and the same as the from my cooks there's only so much room they have in their station for product and if that product's not moving it's it doesn't benefit anybody because then it's not fresh enough so the plant-based dish that we put on the menu it might be one of these and it might be some other ones that we sell has to compete with a lobster and a filet mignon so we got to get real creative and convince someone, because it's not the price. People walk in a restaurant, they don't care if it's $20 main course or 60 They didn't come in. They're not, they're not bargain hunters, usually. They're really, they, and, and in fact, the person that's out there looking for a plant-based product is usually more sophisticated and or willing to pay more. Right? So we need to manipulate the menu to sh showcase how good it is, and so that, we, that our wait staff, the salesperson, can convince this person to try this. You have to go away from your safety net and try this. So it's in the verbiage, it's in the tasting, the education of the wait staff and the salespeople and the promotion of the parent company that's getting out there and saying, listen, oh, I, I, that corn brand, I recognize that. I saw it somewhere. It's, it's in my headlight somewhere. And then and doing something like these dishes that are safe for someone to think, well, you know what, I like, I like chicken wings, I like succotay, I like soup. I like ratatouille, I know, I like pasta, so that they can segue into something more unique. The vegetarians are already sold on it, they know it. The vegans, the plant-based people, they know it is. So how do we get other people to spend that Friday night out and give up that sirloin steak or give up that pasta dish to try one of these? That's, that's the, the marketing and the salesmanship of, and education of our waitstaff and our, our, and our chefs. And, and, sh and being able to convince them that this is really good. If my voice is telling them I'm proud of this product and I think we can do it, and it's not a paycheck, and it's not just a promotion, then they're gonna believe it, and we gotta start eating it. If I have this at home in my freezer, nobody knows, it's not gonna help sell it if I'm eating it at home, so I gotta start putting it on my menus and believe in the product, and, and, and give it the real estate it deserves. And it might be a slow mover, but we know we're committed to try and move something forward. So sometimes you have a lost leader, and you keep it on the menu because you re I remember having a pigeon dish with foie gras on my menu, right? I, it was one of the best dishes I've ever made. Still is, right? We, we talk about it. Didn't sell that. And I kept, you know, I was waiting for one day. And it was never going to sell. You know, it was never going to be the best seller dish, but it meant something to me because the craftsmanship behind it was great. The craftsmanship behind this and the idea behind this and the forward thinking behind a plant-based product that's delicious and versatile as this is something we get behind. And like I said, 40 years ago, that squab dish didn't sell, and today it still wouldn't sell. You know why? Because there's nobody out there pushing squab, right? And, and you're not gonna convince people that squab's that good for you or that versatile, right? So that's that what happens with, with certain products. It's just, it's get out in the field and throw fastballs, and that's what, that's what these, the plant-based companies are doing. I'm getting educated. I, I, like I said, when I first got it, and I know Stephen, and I, I really admire what he does, and he's always ahead of, he's a, he's a thinker, you know? I'm like, yeah, I'll try it. And I forgot I was eating a plant-based product, and then I, now I believe it. Now I, can, now I can put this on my menu, and you're talking about having 12, 24 dishes on your menu. If you give one of those dishes up 
for a plant-based product, it's got to be good. Because I need chicken, I need beef, I need fish, I need shellfish, I need pasta. So all of a sudden, I'm filling up all the slots, and I need this. Now, this beauty of this product is it can be chicken, it can be pasta, right? It can be fish. I can serve, I can serve scallops on top of that, on top of that fungi protein and still have a great dish and not have to say it's all plant-based or nothing, but it's an introduction of saying, you know what? It's scallops with mushroom patties, but a, a plant-based protein, and I get, I, get, I get somebody in the pool. They're swimming now. They're liking it, right? Next week, they might, then they're going to trust it, right? And it's better than potato pancakes, it's a, you know, and, it's, and it's better than an uh, English muffin. And this stuff here, I just tasted, fantastic. It's fantastic. It's delicious. And a blind tasting, you would not know. Nobody would know. Especially when you're starting to glaze it. And you, especially if you're dipping something in Tabasco and blue cheese. Right? Not that I, I'm, I'm not a, a buffalo chicken wing fan. I'm just saying the, the amount of manipulation that some of our snack foods and signature American dishes that you see like those. This on a cob salad, home run. And so it's just a matter of getting out there and continuing to educate people and making, if the product is good, it needs marketing and it needs believers. And it needs to be put in the hands of the right chefs so that it's handled correctly and it doesn't get beat to death. You know, when you see, I remember, I'm old. I'm, I remember when the Kiwi first hit ShopRite, right? I remember when creme brulee hit the shelves and when and, and Caesar dressing. Another example of something that's really so good that gets put in the wrong hands and dumbed down, and all of a sudden, I can't, people don't look at creme brulee in a restaurant as a special item anymore when you see it in ShopRite. Or like the kiwi, people didn't know what to do with it. It was on every fruit platter in the world in the 80s. It was that green fruit, right? And all of a sudden, it just, you don't really see it. I saw it this morning, that's why I bring it up, I was in the market. We don't see that in the East Coast anymore. Anyway, here we go. Cups, lettuce cups. And from a labor standpoint, you've got a product that needs no butchery. You can thaw and serve. It's not going to go bad. And it's going to taste the same every time unless something goes wrong. Are you up top? Yeah. I think it does, and Stephen can answer that. Oh, wait, it's on the wrong one. Yeah, so the question is, um, does it need to reach a certain temperature um, uh, to be um, food safe? Yes. Well, uh, in any good cooking practices, we want to reach a temperature of 165. Um, this product um, should reach 165, especially if you're going to hot hold it. Um, and we're looking and we're partnering with um, other processors, and we're looking for ways to extend shelf life on our product and have it where it's ready to eat. So our plan on those grilled cutlets, we're done with all that. Um, those are for ready to eat. Those will be processed ready to eat with a 30-day chilled shelf life. So they can be eaten cold on the, sa on the salad, or they can be heated up and put on the salad or in the center of the plate. The boneless wings, um, the meatless boneless wings should reach 135, whether you're putting them in the fryer or the oven as well as the patties, and we have nuggets also. Answer your question? Uh, oh, thanks. So I have a two-part question. Um, while while Chef is putting that final thing on, we're done. We're you're done. done. Last oh, plate. look at that! It's gorgeous. Rebecca. Woo! All right, <laughs> Rebecca. I, I, I didn't even use that sign. She did a great job. She's been working all day. So she here's has. the uh, lettuce cups. We call Beautiful. this lettuce cups, Rebecca. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. And I, honestly, I would we'll put these on the menu. So, we Chef, when you put them on the menu, how will you call it out? Will you call it out as meatless? Will you say corn? How, how will you I would, identify I would it? Keep the, the, I would use the logo of the brand. Okay. 
I put in parentheses next to plant-based protein. Okay. And then I would get something very, a catchy name. <coughs> so that they ask the waiter, hey, what is this? You know, mm -hmm. what is, you know, we have something called Donnie Brasco chicken wings on the menu now. In a little Italian place. Similar to this. Mm -hmm. Capicola. It's like, a, it's like an antipasto on sticks. Right? right. And people remember it. They're like, hey, I had the Donnie Brascos. So we need to get something that's a little bit more of a neighborhood name, not corn plant-based, but it can be the, like the corn on the cob is cute. It is cute. <coughs> but you have to come up with something that's, mm -hmm. they get it, it says plant-based, but you, it's not a religion of plant-based. You don't, you're not, you know, you don't have to be a vegetarian or just eat plant-based food. But speaking of religion, <laughs> that's that's in the future. That's coming. It's coming soon. I love. There that. is a religion in hospitality that we should all follow, and one of those tenets of that religion should be working with farmers, working with the future working with, the, with sustainability and creating things for the future that are long lasting and innovative. And you know, that's some of the stuff from what we do. And like I said, being behind a product and helping to launch something that, you know, I remember Blue Grab Butter. I did the first ad for Blue Grab Butter. And, I, and it's still around, I guess. Plus fat, it means plus fat. <laughs> <laughs> But it was a great butter, and when, but when little things count, you know, you, 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 time flies, man. Get, get on the train and be part of something that's going to be around for a long time. And, uh, and that's what I think this is. But we would certainly now, even to be honest with you, I haven't cooked this much of this food in one day in one setting than today. Okay. I've been doing bits and pit like, I don't need to cook this at home to know this is going to work. Mm -hmm. I've made this. We made that. This was just in the head, but I, you know, that's how we design dishes. But I ate the product and this and the uh, and the lettuce cups. And I got to be honest with you, if I was served any one of these dishes for the same prices as anything else on our menu, I'd be quite happy. I'd actually feel better about myself for trying it and and be and being convinced that that this is a it, this is a good product, whether you're a plant-based eater or not. It's still a good value and a good product. And you don't have to be a plant-based eater just to eat it. Just like you don't have to be a vegetarian to eat a vegetarian pasta. So I went to a kosher restaurant in Long Branch, New Jersey, steakhouse, uh, nine months ago because they stole my whole salt wall technique. And I figured I'd go show up. <coughs> and, uh, and it was good. It was excellent. And the service was good. It was a New York-style restaurant. There was no shellfish, no pork, which, yeah, I didn't miss it. But the product was good, and nor were, but I'm willing to go try things. Right. And I think there's a lot of people, <clears throat> consumers, when they trust a brand, they're willing to try something new, especially in the, in the day and age of the, this, the postcard that's in your pocket, the Instagram, being able to say, look what I, I found something new. So awesome. be on the, be on the uh, get on a surfboard first and catch a wave. Thank you, Chef. Okay. Yeah. Amen. Okay. <laughs> um, Chef Stephen, this is a question for you. Um, how do you want it to be on a menu? Do you want it to say corn with the trademark? Do you, and how do you want servers to describe what it is? Because uh, that's a really good question. Mm -hmm. um, I think if I didn't work with the corn fellows here and the, and the group involved, I wouldn't think that much about how important the corn brand would be, but I think their brand is superior, and I think it's like uh, I think it's like putting Kleenex instead of just tissue, right? I mean, I think that you have it's a bad analogy, but I think that if you're going to drive a Mercedes, you want to tell people you're driving a Mercedes, right? Or, and if you're going to buy F1 Wagyu beef, you want to let people know it's Wagyu beef. So if this is the the, the king and queen of, or queen of the plant-based protein right now, which we're hoping it is, we're gonna tell people this because part of the process is marketing. Marketing is, you know, market, look at liquor companies. Marketing, we were talking about this, and that's a good name to remember. You know, I think it's easy, it's clean, and uh, like I said, you gotta, you, you gotta try it, you gotta try it. If it was called, if, if it's called, uh, Fungi, penicillin, a little bit less, whatever. Yeah, that's a tough sell. But corn, <laughs> corn, we can we can get around corn, right? So yes, we've we've done it, and we did. Like I said, we opened in a blue collar area on a highway to the beach in Jersey, 
and we were selling it. First week out of the gate, as, because we made it, we made it identifiable. It was chicken parmesan, as a plant-based, and it was a one bite, so it wasn't a $30 commitment for your dinner. It was like, you know, it's a shareable thing. If I don't like it, it's not gonna ruin the night. People loved it. People couldn't tell. We're, inve we're investing in the corn brand name. Um, you know, unaided awareness around corn is low, but um, we're changing that. And a big fan of uh, Eric David Burke's restaurants, actually we took her there and we signed her on as our CMO, which stands for Chief Mom Officer, is Drew Barrymore. <laughs> yeah. And uh, she's a flexitarian and a big fan of the brand. And uh, the other thing, how we position it, because of the Q and corn, um, we've started marketing it as meatless chicken, C-H-I-Q-I-N. And um, is it Q-I-N or Q-E-I-N? And so we're playing with the Q, we're playing with the brand name. When spread awareness goes up, we're, we're predicting great value in marketing it as a corn meatless product. And I don't know the, uh, the price structure yet, but from what I overheard last night at the uh, dinner table is the value in, in buying this, I think it was at Costco or one of the stores where you bought so many pieces for so much, is, is incredible for, especially in the day and age where prices for restaurants are crazy. Prices for everybody are crazy. So, um, so it's good timing. Well, thank you so much. Um, I'm, I'm sorry we have to cut this short, but we do have another uh, demo in about a half an hour, so we've got to turn this over. I want to say thank you to Chef David Burke. Let's give him a round of applause. Thank you to Stephen Khalil and Corn Foods for support of this demo. And um, we will now have a half an hour break before the next session. At 4.30, you will go to your pre-registered seminar, which is listed on the back of your badge. Um, if there are any issues, you know, we have our CIA staff all around. Please ask us. Um, and then, the, oh, and then to just say that uh, the lettuce cups with the corn meatless crumbles and the corn meatless seared cutlet with orzo and ratatouille will be available to sample at our global plant forward reception. Thank you.